Okay, good afternoon everyone. This is Jonathan Maudsley. I am the Science Advisor at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and I'm delighted to welcome you this afternoon to our webinar, which is being co-sponsored between the U.S. Forest Service Research and Development Program and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. This afternoon's webinar is one in a series that is co-sponsored by the Forest Service and AFWA. Today we will be learning about an overview of the Animal Welfare Act and Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees with Dr. Pat Klein, attending veterinarian for the U.S. Forest Service IACUC and National Program Lead for Fish and Wildlife Health at the U.S. Forest Service Research and Development Washington office. Before we get started on today's webinar, I just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping details. First, uh, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies at YouTube channel. If you Google AFWA and YouTube channel, you will find a link to this recording once it's uh, available and posted, as well as other recordings of other webinars that we've hosted with the Forest Service and other partners. So please feel free to check that out. Um, second, we will be muting the conference lines after the introduction so that you'll be able to hear Dr. Klein more distinctly. What this means is if you happen to have a question during the webinar, we invite you to write your question in the chat box, which you'll find in the lower left-hand portion of your screen, and type your question there. And then at the end of the presentation, if we have time for questions, I will read through the questions that we've received in the chat box and then give Dr. Klein a chance to respond. If we still have time left over at the end of the hour, we will open up the lines for a more a detailed traditional Q&A, but we do try to be respectful of people's time and try to limit these webinars to an hour uh, depending on time and interest. So I'd like to uh, thank our partners at the U.S. Forest Service, particularly Monica Thomasy, John Roethlisberger, and Pat Klein for helping to produce today's webinar, as well as Nicole Zimmerman. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, John Roethlisberger to introduce today's speaker. John. Hi. Hello. Before you get started, um, we're having trouble getting logged into the webinar. Is there a, a direct link other than the call info one? Because it doesn't seem to be uh, connecting. Who is this? Uh, this is Dr. Beckman with the last Department of Fish and Game. Hey, just a suggestion from the outside, there's an extra space in that address. If you remove that space and then cut and paste the link rather than click on it, it worked for me that way. Oh, wait, well, we're having to type it in from the paper because we don't have, we don't have access to the, the email on this um, computer. So what, where is the space? Well, there shouldn't be any space in that address. I don't have it in front of me. Oh, okay. Let me look here. So after 18-D-R-Y-U-S, and then 5-1-I-U. Yeah. There's no space there. Okay. Um, is that a 0 or a 1? I mean a 0 or an O, capital O. I believe it's a 0. Okay. Just from the shape of it. All the other letters are small case. Thank lowercase. you very much. Uh, John, at this point. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan, and, and thanks, everyone, for calling in. Uh, I, I hope everyone is able to log in uh, in the next few minutes here. Uh, please let us know if it, if it doesn't work out, and we'll try to find another solution. Um, but as Jonathan said, my name is John Roethlisberger. I'm the National Program Leader for Fish and Aquatic Ecology Research for the Forest Service. And uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to partner with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, on this webinar series where uh, we have the opportunity to share with biologists and managers some of the work that we are doing in the fish and wildlife uh, research area of the Forest Service uh, to support fish and wildlife management. Uh, through this webinar series, we try to address questions that state agencies and other biologists uh, have questions about. Um, including what research the Forest Service is currently conducting on fish and wildlife, uh, what are some of the results of our completed uh, research, and, uh, and other scientific topics of interest. Uh, today's topic is the application of institutional animal care and use committees in the fish and wildlife context. 
And uh, this topic was identified as one that would be of interest uh, to, to this group. And we're really fortunate today to have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Pat Klein uh, of the Forest Service. She's going to share with us some of the basics of the Animal Welfare Act and the uh, Institutional Animal Care and Use Committees that are associated uh, with the Act and, and how they relate to fish and wildlife research. <coughs> so just quickly to give a little background on uh, Dr. Klein, uh, as Jonathan said, she's the U.S. Forest Service Senior Veterinary Medical Officer and serves as our attending veterinarian, veterinarian for our IACUC. Uh, before joining the Forest Service in 2016, she worked for USDA APHIS Veterinary Services for 10 years and served in uh, a variety of national capacities, uh, including as the APHIS Veterinary Services Wildlife Disease Liaison. She began her veterinary career as a wildlife veterinarian and pathologist. Uh, she worked at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, where she managed healthcare, quarantine, biosecurity, and disease investigations. Uh, she has an impressive academic background. She graduated from the University of Pennsylvania's School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, she earned her master's degree in toxicology at St. John's University in New York. Uh, she also did uh, a postdoctorate fellowship at Johns Hopkins University and was a resident at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, she uh, also, interestingly, one, one more note on her bio, bio she is a team commander for uh, veterinary medical assistance uh, teams in uh, disaster response uh, situations. And she's done that work for more than 15 years. She's deployed to locations uh, such as New Orleans in response to Hurricane Katrina, uh, to New Jersey in uh, response to Hurricane Sandy, and even to uh, New York uh, in response to the 9-11 uh, attacks. And, and so it's really uh, ha has a great uh, scope of uh, background and breadth of work that she's done. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from her today. So I'll turn it over to her now. Great. At this point, we're going to mute the lines. The conference has been muted. Pat, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Jonathan. Thanks. If you wanted to put up the first slide, they are perfect. <laughs> I love when technology works. <laughs> Isn't often. Um, so thank you, and for those of you, I do hope you get your connections. I do know that this uh, webinar is being recorded, and I can certainly also make my slides available. Uh, if anybody wants to get in contact with me, it will be the last slide. We'll have my contact information. So with the time that we have today, I do want to acknowledge that, wow, this is a tough subject, <laughs> and I hope that I will do it justice, and I will provide our audience with some salient information. Certainly, I'm going to provide a lot of questions, and I'm certainly hoping for your feedback. To me, this is um, all about the greater good and how we're all trying to move this issue in a larger dialogue forward. So we have the next slide, please. So the first question that I asked myself when trying to put this presentation together was, well, what do I need to know? And I kind of asked that question a few years ago when I came over to the Forest Service to help them uh, set up their Institutional Animal Care and Youth Committee, or to make it easier to say IACUC. So when I use the word IACUC, that's what I mean. So I did, wanted to kind of put that series of questions together. So what do I, or what do we need to know? For today, I want to go through a very brief, uh, underlying brief, overview of these animal welfare laws and regulations and some of the policies and guidelines. I will, as we go through the presentation, try to um, identify that it is relevant to the wildlife field work that we're doing, and when does the Animal Welfare Act um, and the regulations apply to wildlife. Um, also, I want to talk about you know, why did the Forest Service establish um, an IACUC, um, and what actually does this body, this committee do, and also how does that review process work. Um, and then bring it back home to the audience on this call is, you know, what does your agency or why does your agency need an IACUC and some of the thoughts that hopefully you're going through yourself as well. So next slide, please. So let's start out first with the um, USDA Animal Welfare Act. <clears throat> so let's rewind the clock, and it's a little bit more than 50 years ago now. Uh, last year was the 50th anniversary of the 
um, implementation of the Animal Welfare Act or the enactment. And it does actually go back to something called Pepper the Dalmatian or Pepper the Dog. Um, it's a longer story, but suffice to say that back in the 50s, it was not uncommon, unfortunately, for pets to be stolen from private property and to be basically sold by nefarious animal dealers into animal research institutions. Pepper the Dog was pretty much the poster child or the poster dog that really set the political wheels turning towards the formation of the first what was called Laboratory Animal Welfare Act. And indeed, it was a pet dog that was stolen out of the backyard of, of someone's property. And unfortunately, by the time the property owners tried to track down what happened to this poor dog, it had already been used in a laboratory research situation. But the politics played out shortly thereafter, and by 1965-66 was enacted the Animal Welfare Act, initially to protect owners of their pet dogs and cats from this kind of theft and use in research and experimentation. There were also some humane standards for the treatment of these animals established. And that was where we started. But by 1970, and there's been many amendments to the Animal Welfare Act over a long period of time, I'm just highlighting a couple of them that are poignant for what we need to talk about today. In 1970, the act was amended to expand the definition of animal to warm-blooded animals, with some exceptions that we'll talk about momentarily. So just keep that in mind. So by 1970, we now have warm-blooded animals. But by 1985, and that's an important year, which will come up again, that's when the Act was again amendment, amended to now establish these Animal Care and Use Committees, or these IACUCs. So that's where, in 1985 going forward, we have a lot of the policies and the regulations that guide the Animal Care and Use Committees and their oversight responsibility. There were also issues of pain and distress um, that were um, being incorporated into that amendment, and that the investigators, the PIs, must consider alternatives to any painful or distressful procedures. And that word alternatives is going to come up again as well. It also established what's called the Animal Welfare Information Service or Center at the USDA's National Agricultural Library, which is located in Beltsville, Maryland. That also is an important resource that will come back up later in the presentation, but I want you to be aware that there is a wonderful facility. The National Ag Library has the Animal Welfare Information Center that has a lot of wonderful uh, information and resource for literature searches and even um, issues about wildlife and research. And finally, 1989, another amendment. This is where the field study definition first gets introduced and has become more prominent since then. So next slide, please. So taking those key pieces of legislation into mind, just remember as we go forward that those are going to be pieces of information that are pertinent to our issues in wildlife research. There are some definitions that you need to understand as well. One is animal. Remember I talked about warm-blooded animals. Well, that is the definition in the Animal Welfare Act, that an animal is any warm-blooded animal used in research, teaching, testing, experimentation, to some extent exhibition if you're a zoo, but with certain exceptions. There are certain animal groups that are excluded. Rats and mice that, and birds that are bred for use in research, that's important. Those that are bred for use in research are excluded from this definition. Some horses are excluded, the ones that are not used in research, and some livestock and poultry that are used for food and fiber or for certain testing to improve breeding and production are excluded. And amphibians, reptiles, fish, and invertebrates are excluded or not covered by the Animal Welfare Act, right, because they're not warm-blooded animals. However, birds technically are covered by the act, by the law, but regulations have yet to be implemented. So it's kind of a little bit of a gray area, but technically right now, USDA Animal Care is not um, overseeing the regulation of birds, although in our case, wild birds could be covered uh, beyond the Animal Welfare Act. We'll get into that in a second. The other big definition that's important to us is field study. And I will sort of acknowledge that it is a difficult definition because it leaves a lot to be interpreted. But it is, uh, by definition, a study that's conducted on free living wild animals in their natural habitat. It is a field study, to be a field study and therefore be excluded from the Animal Welfare Act, you would um, have to have something that does harm or does involve an invasive 
I'm sorry, does not harm, does not involve an invasive procedure, or does not materially alter the behavior of an animal under study. So let me repeat that. So a field study, to meet the criteria of a field study to be excluded from the Animal Welfare Act, it would be a study that does not harm, does not involve an invasive procedure, does not materially alter the behavior of an animal under study. Huh. Okay, well that was easy. Not really, because that definition leaves a lot to be interpreted, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Next slide. There are other policies and guidelines, not laws and regulations, but policies and guidelines that could apply to our situation when we conduct fish and wildlife research. One is the Health Research Extension Act, again, 1985, remember that's an important date, that was 1985 is when that AWA was amended to establish IACUCs and other um, standards. So the Health Research Extension Act of 1985 indeed is a law, but there were no regulations ever promulgated to enforce it. That particular law, or the Extension Act, was meant to expand, um, in this case under the Public Health Service, to expand the coverage of all vertebrates. So that's where we now look at in <coughs> extending from the Animal Welfare Act of warm-blooded um, animals to all vertebrates. And if you are involved at all in the Public Health Service um, type of research guidelines, mostly because you're getting NIH funding, then the document that one uses is called the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, or as everybody calls it, the Guide. This really applies to those institutions that are receiving NIH funding. If you do receive NIH funding, you must abide by their additional policies under the PHS policy guidelines. The other committee that was also established in 1985 was this um, Interagency Research Animal Committee called or IRAC, and that was U.S. federal government agencies got together and they formed this agreement or accord. It includes USDA, it includes HHS, DOI, a variety of other federal um, departments that agreed by what is known as the U.S. government principles for the utilization and care of vertebrate animals in teaching, research, and training, shortly known as U.S. government principles. It's a pledge to extend animal welfare standards of the Animal Welfare Act to all vertebrate species. So again, here comes this concept of extending the spirit of the Animal Welfare Act to all vertebrate species. And there are all those signatories to that agreement in the federal agency system. Now, one thing I need you to know, particularly if you're in state wildlife agencies, those of you who may be getting National Science Foundation or NSF funding, in 2015, the National Science Foundation and the Public Health Service had established a memorandum of understanding stating that if you're getting either NSF money or to the extent PHS or NIH money, but they have a memorandum of understanding that says if you get NSF funding, you must abide by the PHS policy. It's a little trickier than that, and we can maybe have some time to talk about it offline. But I want you to be aware that if you're getting NSF funding, you too may need to pay attention to uh, some of the public health service policies for animal welfare. There are a number of professional society taxon specific guidelines that I mentioned at the end of the presentation, Society of Mammalogy, Ornithological Council, uh, fisheries groups that have themselves at the urgency uh, or urgence of the National Science Foundation back in the 80s to develop their own guidelines for field research, and they have become most helpful, and they too have been updated over time. The website, and I will provide you as many website links in this presentation as possible, that will get you to a really great website. It's actually sponsored by NIH um, or the Office of Lab Animal Welfare to see more about all of these documents and get more information, um, particularly on some of these MOUs and policies. Next slide. Another important concept is the concept of alternatives called the three R's. What are the three R's? Reduction, refinement, and replacement. This is important and it does in affect us or impact us in wildlife research in what we can and cannot accomplish or pledge to do. It is originally based on a, an article or a treatise published by British researchers, last names Russell and Birch, 1959. 1959 is way before the Animal Welfare Act in 1966, but in those late 50s, the animal welfare issues were coming to prominence. And so in European theater, 
they were already a little bit ahead of us. They were talking about these issues of humane use of animals in laboratory research. What came from that document was what's called the alternative concept, or the three R's, the reduction, refinement, replacement, meaning reduction. Can you, in designing your experiment, reduce the number of animals you use to still obtain the same statistically relevant information? Refinement. Can you, in your research study, modify your procedures, whatever those are, to minimize pain and distress? Some of this would be surgical procedures. In our case, it might be capture and restraint procedures or mobilization procedures. How about replacement? Well, in a laboratory animal model, can you substitute living animals for either non-animal methods like computer models or less sentient animal models. Now, in our situation, that's really not possible. But again, lab animals are used often as animal models for other purposes, right? They're studying human diseases or other animal diseases. They're animal models. And in recent years, they have been able to do a lot of replacement in the laboratory research world. But in the wildlife research world, we study those animals generally for their own benefit or for their own purposes or to know more about those animals, so we generally can't replace them. And so this is one of those areas where it differs in wildlife research. So the web link there, again, leads you to that paper by Russell and Birch if you want to read a little bit more about their entire um, treatise. Also, USDA Animal Care, which is the agency, federal agency responsible for enforcement of the Animal Welfare Act, they too have a lot of policies, and the two I list here specifically talk about their guidance and their policies on considerations of these alternatives to painful and distressful procedures, and there's a web link to get you to those documents. Next slide. Okay, so a lot of information in a short amount of time, but I hope you keyed into some of those issues that I was trying to identify that are pertinent. So let me talk a little bit about Forest Service um, and try to you know, make it a little more personal. So why did we, why did Forest Service establish an iCook? Um, and we've done so relatively recently. That's not because we were out of compliance with the law. We just had a, we found a better way to do it. So what happened about four or five years ago, as I understand, was that the Forest Service scientists actually themselves started to raise concerns about the need for our own Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. They oftentimes are collaborating with university colleagues, and so in those collaborative situations, they would um, submit their collaborative research proposals to the University of IACUC. That's all above board. That's all fine. That's great. However, in some cases, the University of IACUCs were not maybe so well informed or able to extrapolate the laws that were originally written for biomedical research animals to the wildlife situation. And so some of the Forest Service scientists had struggled with trying to talk to these university eye cooks in those situations and stop trying to force a round peg in a square hole and trying to have the eye cooks help, you know, help them and better interpret how their wildlife research needed to be approved. Some university eye cooks actually would not even cover Forest Service wildlife research if we didn't automatically have a, um, a collaborator at that institution. And there were some consequences that were being unfortunately realized to be ah. research conducted without an eye cook approval. Much of that is, is uh, playing out most recently in some of the journals and publications that refuse to accept manuscripts unless they have eye cook approval. And in some cases, state and federal agency wildlife permits are also requiring IACUC approval before research on the wildlife is, um, is started. Also for Forest Service, we have our own code of scientific ethics that is dated back in 2000, and I've got to give credit to the, the agency for having that foresight, but they talk in that code of ethics about the humane treatment of all vertebrate animals involved in research studies. So from within our own institution, there was an upwelling of interest to form our own IACUC. Next slide. And again, to just bring that message home, the, again, the reason that we were seeing clearly on the horizon is the why to form your own Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee is this is an example. Uh, not to pick on Matt um, Allender, who's a really great researcher, but the article is highlighted by that ethics statement. And many journals are now coming to that point where they are requiring IACUC approval 
to um, publish the research manuscripts that are submitted to them. And so in this case, it says, all activities for this study were specifically approved by the University Animal Care and Youth Committee. And that is becoming more commonplace. Next. Next slide, please. So again, why did we establish our IACUC? Well, leadership here in the Forest Service committed to doing so in early 2014 based on a lot of the concerns being raised by our scientists. Uh, we became an officially registered research facility under USDA Animal Care back in 2015, and we started our own institutional IACUC in October of that year. Now, we also have extended our oversight to all vertebrate species. We are in compliance with the Animal Welfare Act, which is about warm-blooded animals, but because of all the other doctrines that I mentioned before, because of our scientific code of ethics, we made an institutional decision to extend coverage to all vertebrate species, including fish, amphibians, and reptiles. Now, IACUC also serves in an advisory capacity for non-research activities. That may be an important point to just pause for a second. We here in the Forest Service, as John had mentioned earlier, we have a, a research unit that supports wildlife management activities that we do in the National Forest System. And at this time, our IACUC, although we do not have direct oversight over our wildlife, quote, management activities, we are serving in an advisory capacity for any and all of those wildlife management type activities if they need advice on chemical mobilization, trapping, um, marking, whatever is the issue. We, as the IACUC oversight, are available as advisors and to provide guidance. We are working through a larger dialogue that is yet to be realized is what else does that mean for us down the road when it comes to differentiating research versus management. And I will come back to that in a moment. Next slide. Who are the IACUC members? Well, based on the, the law, based on the Animal Welfare Act, the minimum you need to form an IACUC or a committee is three core members. Those are the required members. That's a chairperson, an attending veterinarian like me, and you have to have one community member or what they call a non-affiliated member, somebody who is not affiliated at all with your institution, not by marriage, not by um, birthright, not by family, not by employment. That person serves as the external or community member who represents societal perspectives on animal welfare. That's the one sort of grounding moment of having that one external member. Everybody else is likely somebody within your own institution. It's your colleagues who have collateral duty assignments to be on the committee. Now, for us in the Forest Service, we added an additional community member because those truly are volunteers. They are not paid positions, and we acknowledge and recognize their commitment to serving as a volunteer on our committee. So we have two community members just to make sure that they can each divide their time as to which committee meetings they come to, or in most cases, both of them attend. We also, in our case, added representatives <coughs> from um, all of our five research stations, and that's what works best for us. So there's no upper limit as to the number of members you can have on an IACUC committee. Um, but the minimum is that the three core. We also are lucky to have an IACUC administrator that we, is the person that keeps us all moving in the right direction, is the glue that does all of our administrative tasks and keeps us on task. And the institutional official is someone in your higher leadership in your institution that is a responsible person to represent the institution publicly on animal welfare issues and also to oversee the IACUC, uh, the committee. And that is also a required position. Next, please. Next slide. So what does this IACUC thing do? What, is, what does this committee do? Bottom line, it ensures compliance with the Animal Welfare Act, the regulations, any other oversight policies, and any institutional specific guidelines and procedures. So it is our internal bellwether, right, and ensures that we maintain compliance with the, the law and the regulations for animal welfare. But internally, it also is the body, the committee, that reviews and approves these um, proposed animal activities, these research studies. Uh, involved in research, teaching, testing, and experimentation. I always use the word research, but when I say research, it also means if there are any activities that involve a teaching or a testing type of situation or experimentation. Next slide, please. 
Further, the IACUC, this is important, the IACUC determines if the proposed animal activities or the proposed research study that's presented to them meets the criteria or the definition of a field study which would be exempt or excluded by the Animal Welfare Act. It is the IACUC that makes that decision, and there's been some conversation you know, on and off over time about who makes that decision. Is it the PI, is it the investigator that decides that, oh, I have a field study, I'm just going to go out and do blah, 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 and therefore it's a field study? No. Um, is it uh, the head of that department that makes that decision, you know, the supervisor of that investigator who decides, oh, it's a field study? No. <laughs> the IACUC is legally responsible because they are charged to maintain compliance with the Animal Welfare Act and, and the other laws and regulations to make a determination if that proposal and the description of those animal activities meet the criteria of a field study. Remember, what's the definition of a field study? A field study to be exempt from the Animal Welfare Act and the IACUC oversight does not harm, is not invasive, and does not materially alter the behavior of an animal. That's a mouthful, and it's really hard to interpret based on all the different animal species that we conduct wildlife and fish research on, and the types of activities that we are involved in, uh, you know, uh, watching those animals, monitoring those animals, capturing those animals, to figure out whether that meets that criteria. And we have talked with USDA Animal Care. They are wonderful folks and colleagues, um, but they have determined that they don't need to further define what a field study is, rather to leave the interpretation up to the IACUCs at, their, at the respective institutions. Next slide, please. Other responsibilities of the IACUC, um, other than that really important part, which is reviewing proposals and approving them, the IACUCs are also responsible for doing the semi-annual reports. These are internal reports to the institutional official. This is an internal review to make sure, you know, how is the IACUC functioning? If you have an animal care program, how do you need standard operating procedures? Do you need more of them? Uh, if you have actual brick and mortar facilities that you do your research in, you have veterinary care and record keeping. Also, the IACUC is responsible for providing opportunities for training to the IACUC members and to the researchers on animal welfare issues, even on technical proficiencies, um, personnel qualifications. So all of these things fall under the auspices of the IACUC responsibility. And twice a year, the IACUC basically does a self-assessment and reports what they're doing well, and may, they have some deficiencies, and then they have to figure out how to correct those deficiencies. So for us, for example, in Forest Service, you know, we're still relatively new in this longer process, and we're still developing some standard operating procedures and some technical protocols and things that make us work better and more efficiently. Next slide. But there is also an important report, the annual report to USDA Animal Care, and that is the official form, 7023, an official form that we need to all fill out when you are a registered um, institution under USDA Animal Care. We do report to them annually by December 1st um, all the Animal Welfare Act covered animals. So what does that mean? Those are the warm-blooded animals. Those are not the fish, those are not the reptiles, those are not the amphibians, and actually right now they're not the birds either. They're all the warm-blooded animals that are covered currently by the Animal Welfare Act used in research, teaching, testing, experimentation. And it covers, for the purposes of that reporting period, it's actually the federal fiscal year. So we have to then go back in our records and summarize the species of animals and the numbers of them that were used in that time frame. And then we also have to list them in the appropriate categories called C, D, and E. And I'll spend a second or two explaining what that is. When we talk about pain and distress, remember back in 1985 and going forward, this issue of pain and distress um, has come into uh, key prominence. So they have categorized pain and distress in these basically three important categories. Category C is whenever you do an animal activity that has some kind of like transient pain or maybe a momentary distress, but doesn't require any kind of um, sedation, anesthesia, you know, medication, pain relief, that's category C. What would that be like? Well, maybe you trap, live trap an animal, you take it out, you physically restrain it for a moment, you collect a blood sample, or you put a band on it, and then you let it go. 
that could be a category C because it's momentary. Even the prick of a needle could be considered momentary. But there's no other need to uh, use any kind of anesthesia or sedation for the purposes of pain relief. Category D, next step up, is now you have to use some type of anesthesia, sedation, or, or analgesic pain modification or pain relief because the animal is going to go through a painful procedure. Traditionally, that might be a surgical procedure, something where you actually had to anesthetize the animal. You're putting in an abdominal transmitter, radio telemetry transmitter, and you're doing abdominal surgery, for example. So that requires anesthesia, minimally sedation, and certainly some pain relief. That's a D. E is at the far end where, more likely in laboratory animal experiments, the animal's going to go through some type of painful or distressful procedure, but based on the study design and the outcomes they're looking for, they cannot provide any pain relief, any anesthesia, any sedation. That's a red flag. Category E definitely requires certain justification. I want to bring home an important point here that's not listed on the slide. There are many times in wildlife research where we have to go out and do chemical immobilization on animals, right? We do that because we need to safely approach them and handle them so that we're safe and the animal is safe, right? So that's a form of capture is using chemical mobilization to capture the animal and restrain and handle it. That is not the same as category D. That is using those types of chemical mobilization uh, protocols to safely capture and restrain the animal. That is different than using anesthetics for surgical procedures, okay? And so that's part of the discussion that we have in wildlife research is what fits into those categories versus what doesn't fit because of the purposes that we use those, those drugs and chemicals. Um, and that annual report, as I mentioned before, is due to USDA by December 1st every year. Next slide. Next, thank you. Um, other IACUC responsibilities, just to kind of finish this section out, is um, if you have animal facilities, brick and mortar housing facilities, and that might include a standing enclosure if you're housing animals or keeping animals in an indoor-outdoor enclosure. Um, or, again, these sort of permanent study areas where animals are housed for more than 12 hours, then those require semi-annual or twice a year inspection. Now, that's problematic for us, isn't it? Because oftentimes we're doing field research way out in some remote area where it's not something that you're going to send your uh, inspection team out there to inspect. And that becomes a challenge for us. But this is different than trapping. If you're going out there and you're setting traps to trap animals, that's a temporary situation. You may be checking your traps twice a day or once a day. It may, quote, exceed 12 hours if you don't get there within that 12-hour window. But trapping is a temporary containment process. It is not housing. So that's a, an important distinction. So these inspections are for animals that are housed more than 12 hours, not for animals that are in a sort of routine trapping situation. I'm trying to make it simple, but it can be more complicated. So one of the things that we're challenged with is if we do have these sort of housing situations, and in some cases that's happened for us, then what are these inspection type situations like? Well, we're relying now on this partnership with the PI to have them send us videos or photographs or some type of photo documentation of what that field housing site looks like because we can't just parachute in and do these inspections. That becomes complicated and it's part of a larger dialogue. But the IACUC is also responsible for addressing any complaints that come in. Those may be complaints, um, animal welfare concerns by employees or by the public. They have whistleblower policies that anyone who reports these um, concerns, mostly anonymously, but they should not have any retaliation against them. And the IACUC must dutifully review those complaints, decide if any corrective actions are necessary, report those things to that institutional official, that IO, who is the responsible party in the institution for animal welfare issues, and report and correct any deficiencies, certainly with in-house. And the IACUC actually has the authority to suspend any animal activities until resolution of those issues occurs. Okay, so that's a big deal, and we try to avoid that at all possible, uh, possibilities. Next slide. All right, so quickly I want to go through this animal use proposal. We've talked about, you know, the IACUC function. So for the investigator, what are they doing? What's their contribution to this partnership? 
So the investigator has to give us information to review, not so much about the study design per se, that's being worked out within other parts of their institution, but we want to know of that study design, what are you going to be doing with the animals? What are the animal activities and what is the objectives of your study, the purpose, and how are those animals going to be used? So all study um, or animal use proposals, formats may change between institutions, but they all have this key information that the investigator must provide. And that's listed on these next two slides. So regardless of what the format of the proposal or what order it's listed in, the investigator needs to provide all the personnel that are going to be engaged in the animal activities, the PI, the co-PI, the field techs, whoever that's going to be laying hands on an animal, involved in animal activities, their pertinent training and their experience. They have to give us a description in what they call layman's terms, something that the average person can read and understand, a description of their project and the objectives of their project. Talk about the number and the species of animals and how many they're planning to use, or in this case, cap capture, excuse me, and the justification. And also, again, here comes that alternative, the rationale for using those animals. What are the alternatives that were considered? That's the three R's that comes up again. Is there an opportunity for reduction in the number of animals or refinement in the techniques you're going to be used? And as I said earlier, it's unlikely that any replacement is even um, appropriate. And what's your literature search that supports that justification? Next slide. Also in the animal use proposal, include a description of all those procedures involving animals, capture, restraint, uh, banding, marking, sample collection, surgery, if you're going to be doing any kind of surgical procedures, biopsies, whatever. Um, there's the categories of pain and distress. Identify where you think these animals belong. Are they category C, um, before, during, and after the procedures? There's an area where you fill out sort of a table and you identify and line up these categories of pain and distress, and any methods that you've used to minimize. Also, methods of euthanasia. Now, granted, not all studies intend to euthanize animals. As a matter of fact, most of them don't want to. They want to capture an animal, probably you know, put a tag on it, a telemetry device, a band, and release it, and then go follow it. But stuff happens in the field sometimes. Unfortunately, some animals accidentally may be injured, some not so seriously, some very seriously. There needs to be an emergency euthanasia protocol or procedure outlined in your proposal just in case, right, worst case scenario, something really bad goes wrong and you need to have an approved method of euthanasia for an injured animal that otherwise cannot be salvaged or saved, and that needs to be approved by the IACUC. And then, of course, any disposition of the animals. The disposition might be release. The disposition might be hold for some period of time. The disposition <coughs> might be euthanasia. If there's euthanasia or humane killing, what's the disposal of those animal carcasses? And that uh, website there brings you to a really good link to a wonderful template that um, Bob Sykes, Ellen Paul, Society of Mammalogy, and Archaeological Council and others developed a lovely um, template on an animal use proposal for wildlife research. And if you go to that web link, um, you'll see it on that page. It's amongst some other things but it's been most recently updated in 2016. It's a really, really good place to start that tailors that kind of a proposal to wildlife research. So I would really encourage you to speak that out. Next slide. The other documents that we also require are a job hazard analysis. We also, if you have any standard technical methods and SOPs, just append those to the proposal. You don't have to rewrite the entire how to collect a blood sample if you already got one already um, in place. Um, we want to know if you've got your federal and state wildlife permits because no animal activity starts, regardless of IACUC approval, nothing starts out in the field research until you've got your state and federal wildlife permits, fish and wildlife permits. And any photos or other illustrations that the researcher can provide to us to help the IACUC better understand what they're going to be doing. Um, next slide, please. I want to mention about that job hazard analysis I put in parentheses biosafety. So a JHA oftentimes is talking about people who go and work in the field and all the physical hazards that they may encounter or the environmental hazards they might encounter, but we talk about the biosafety hazards. The reason we bring that into our IACUC is because we feel that that's an animal welfare related issue. Why? Because we talk about 
the folks that are working in the field need to be conscious of zoonotic pathogens potentially or other diseases that they might inadvertently carry from one field study site to another. So we want them to be biosafe, not only for their own safety to exposure to you know, unusual diseases or unusual diseases or zoonotic diseases, but to make sure that they don't become a mechanical fomite or mechanical vector to not use the proper PPE or the proper decontamination procedures and inadvertently move disease from one study site to another. And then you expose a naive animal population in a new study site to something that they didn't see before. And this has become a key issue with white nose syndrome and the decon protocols for white nose or even more recently with some of the bee sal and chytrid fungus issues that are coming up that when you're out working in the field that you use proper PPE and decon before you go from one study site to the next. That also builds into this slide. Again, it's not necessarily exactly the same in a laboratory setting as it is in a field setting, although we want the same principles to apply. So how do those things compare? In biomedical laboratory animal research or in those lab settings, you've got planned facility design, you've got controlled environments, you even have lab animals that have been domestically bred and genetically manufactured in some cases just for those laboratory studies. Not so in field settings, right? We have the natural environment, we have free-ranging wildlife and their natural habitat. We don't sometimes know what zoonotic diseases those animals may be potentially carrying. So our worlds are different, but we try to extrapolate the same principle of biosafety. Next slide. So the review process for the IACUC is as follows. So now we've got the proposal submitted. Um, the IACUC is formed and we're, you know, in in place and functioning and we're reviewing these new proposals. In our case, our IACUC, <coughs> our IACUC meets once a month. Um, we ask for any new proposals to be submitted the first day of that month so we have time to have the committee review them. As the attending veterinarian for the IACUC, I do a preliminary review of every new proposal that comes in and I contact the PI. So I just want to bring home this message that this is a partnership. Okay, we're not out to get the PI, okay, the investigator. We're out to make sure that all is well. And so I work with the investigator initially if I have any sort of veterinary questions that have come up that I need more clarification on. And once the veterinary stuff has been looked at, then the proposals are also distributed to the rest of the committee and for full committee review. And we actually invite our investigators by telephone usually to come to the IACUC meetings when we're reviewing their study proposal. We want them to be on the line so if we come up with any other questions, they're right there to answer those with us and give us the clarification that we need. It's part of the efficiency. It doesn't delay our ability to approve and move forward in this whole process. So hopefully at the end of that um, examination, that review, we approve the proposal. Sometimes we might ask for some additional modifications or clarification, but we try to turn all these things around certainly within that short period of time, and we will notify the, um, the PI within 24 hours of the committee's decision. The one thing I put on the bottom of the slide we call IACUC concurrence. We still have a number of situations where our investigators are collaborating with university colleagues, and those colleagues will put the proposals through their university IACUC, and that's great, that's fine, because that university IACUC needs to support their, their university personnel and their scientists. But we now also want to support our scientists as our own institution. So we will do a similar review of the same proposal and do what we call a concurrence. So if the University of Iowa Cook is the sort of first approving body, that's fine. We'll come in and we'll do a concurrence. We can do it vice versa. But we want to make sure that we are also protecting and supporting our scientists to make sure that if worst case scenario there are complaints or something goes amiss, that that other institution has no legal obligation to support our scientists or defend our scientists, they will support and defend their own personnel. So we just are working in this little happy dance moment right now to try to make sure everything works well. Next slide. So what happens next? Well, once the ICUC uh, proposal is approved, again, no animal activities can start until those state or federal permits are in place. Sometimes things change during the course of the study, and that's okay, but the IACUC must be notified, and we will work through what are called significant or minor amendments. 
But again, the IACUC needs to be notified if something needs to change, some procedure, some technique needs to be altered during the course of the study. The PI does have to give us an annual progress report every year. We've approved them to do a study. At the end of each year, they need to update us on what they've accomplished. And let's say they were approved to capture 100 squirrels, but they only got 50. Well, that's fine, but they just need to tell us that. So we just need to hear back from them at the end of every year. Uh, at, if they're doing a long-term study, there's another process after three years that they actually do a longer review process or a full renewal process. And I'll just skip that for right now for time's sake. Next, Next slide, please. So I'm going to bring this back home to you guys now. I know it's a lot of information, and I hope you'll have the time to go back and read it all more slowly at your own pleasure. But I want to bring this all back home again. What does this mean to your agency, right? to your institution? Does your agency need an IACUC? I want to go back to the original definition of the Animal Welfare Act. It's the animal. It's a warm-blooded animal used in research, teaching, testing, experimentation. That's the definition by the law, right? The legal definition of a warm-blooded animal covered by the Animal Welfare Act in those animal activities. So I asked the other question, well, what's the purpose of the animal activity that your agency is involved in? Easily, by definition in the law, is it research, teaching, testing, experimentation, again, with certain species exceptions, if you fit into that, then yes, you are required to have an IACUC and be part of that system, be part of that process. And again, the IACUC is here to help you, right, not to burden you. It's here to make sure that all those work. <coughs> However, when you get into wildlife um, or land management agencies, even in some of the federal uh, wildlife management agencies, we have things that are called management activities. That's the research versus management larger discussion that is being um, discussed as we speak in lots of different places and with lots of different colleagues. So if the purpose of the animal activity is research, it's advancing scientific knowledge and understanding, it's developing new techniques, it's discovery, it is certainly making contributions to scientific publications, but the research is already captured in the legal definition. So now we move on to management. So here's where I need your help. <laughs> so here's the conundrum. In management, um, animal management activities, they are things that advance agency resource goals, right? They incorporate new techniques in management action. Sometimes you want to use a new capture technique, a new um, sampling technique. But also there are opportunities to contribute to scientific publications. And there's the rub, because now there are a number of journals, like the Journal of Wildlife Management, is starting to ask for IACUC approval before they will review manuscripts. So then the question becomes, what are those types of actions that are used in either research or management? Are they the same or different? Population monitoring and surveillance, population control, whether it's culling, translocation, reintroduction. How about just disease surveillance or disease prevention and control? or outbreak response. I don't have uh, black and white answers for those, and that's, that's the realm of discussion we're in right now. At the end of the day, how does that IACUC benefit the animal activity and, quite frankly, benefit your agency to be able to reach its goals, to you know, use animals in a sort of ethical and responsible way, and actually to get to scientific publications? Next slide, please. So think about just these things. Does your agency need an IACUC? There is concern for legal compliance, particularly if you fit within that standard definition of animal research, teaching, testing, experimentation. There are a lot of journals nowadays that are requiring IACUC approval for publications, and I just am citing a very, very recent article that uh, Dan Mulcahy has just put out in the ILR journal. It's online, and it, he does an interesting overview of many different types of journals that involve wildlife ecology, wildlife research, wildlife management, and of those journals, which are the ones that are starting to require IACUC approval. It's a, it's a brilliant article, and I hope you will take a chance and um, look it up and read it. However, there are societal perspectives, and this is also a, a pretty recent article in the Wildlife Professional from TWF, came out, I think, in the last issue, called Animal Rights and Wildlife Conservation. Well, don't be put off by the rights, animal rights thing. It's an interesting article because that um, that author, that group of authors, looked at this long-term shift in societal, reviews, societal views of our relationships with wild and domestic animals. 
And I'll leave you to read the article. It's very interesting, but it goes to this issue of societal perspectives and how they're changing. And I also would suggest you look at the cost-benefit considerations. Remember, the Eye of Cook is an internal peer review process. Except for that community member, right, that's the grounding to that um, societal perspective of that outside member. Everybody else is typically within your own institution. It's an internal peer review process. It does ensure the ethical, the appropriate use, the value of the research. And to me, it's an opportunity for wildlife veterinarians and wildlife biologists and wildlife managers and, and others to work together towards this common goal, towards this greater good, and protecting the resource. And in our case, you know, it could be wildlife conservation, fish and wildlife conservation. So I don't know if I've answered your questions, but I hope I'm giving you good information by which you can you know, continue to think this through. Next slide. So just the last few slides, where to find additional information. Um, again, those are the taxon-specific guidelines I mentioned earlier and the web links. Those are current web links <coughs> to them. Again, there's more additional um, articles that are being written, and folks like Ellen Paul and, and Bob Sykes and others have been on the forefront of um, great mentoring and leadership to put this information out there in the community for us to think about and try to move this whole process forward. Next slide. I mentioned the National Ag Library and the Animal Welfare Information Center, and this is their web page, at least the one particularly about wildlife, and that's the website uh, listed up there. I really encourage you to go there. They have great information, again, talking about field studies, talking about the sections of the law that pertain to wildlife. Really excellent resource. Next slide. And I also want to put a plug in. There's a group of us, including Bob Sykes and Ellen Paul and myself and a number of other folks, Tracy Thompson at a Park Service, that are working with the Scientist Center for Animal Welfare. Actually, the, that group is hosting a conference that's coming up October 30th, November 1st, San Diego, talking about meeting the challenges of Aya Cook oversight and fish and wildlife research. That's the web link at the bottom. And so I encourage you, if you have the opportunity to attend that meeting, you're more than welcome to come. This is a big dialogue. Most of this conference is trying to focus on those folks that are really entrenched in the lab animal world and trying to get them to understand the needs of the wildlife research community, but you would be most welcome to attend if you have the time. Next slide. More and more acknowledgments. Thank you, Jonathan Mosley, for giving me this opportunity. I hope I've done well by you. <laughs> and a lot of the other people listed here are my mentors, my colleagues, um, my friends, and I'm thankful for all of them to have been involved in this bigger dialogue. And thank you also for all the state and federal fish and wildlife colleagues on this call. Thank you for taking the time to be part of this conversation. Next slide. And just to finish up, this is my grins and giggles slide. Uh, just because I gave you a lot of information, you just need to like present it out. Uh, I want to thank Steve Greiner, who's from Wildlife Services National Wildlife Research um, Center. And once upon a time, he gave me this, um, this sort of montage just to say that wildlife get even with us on occasion. And I just wanted to sort of end with that. <laughs> Hopefully none of you have been in that situation. Um, and then the last slide is just asking for any questions if we have time. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you very much, Pat, for that excellent presentation. We are almost up against our hour, but what I'll suggest we'll do, we do have a number of questions in the chat box, and Pat, if it's okay with you, I think we can, I will read through the one questions that we currently have and then we can wrap up if folks have a few minutes here. And I do apologize for those who were having technical difficulties earlier. I hope we were able to get those resolved. If not, the webinar is being recorded and it is, will be available at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies YouTube channel, which you can find by Googling AFWA and YouTube. So with that, uh, first question here is from Taylor Cotton. How does uh, Iacook and the principles of the Animal Welfare Act apply in the situation of wild horses and burrows? Oh, good. You gave me the easy question first. <laughs> well, that's, that's a tough one because there is research going on with wild horses and burrows where they are capturing some of those animals and they're doing a variety of research on contraception and sterilization, so that fits under the R word. There are also lots of management activities going on out there as well. So there certainly could be an opportunity to consider 
when those animals are being captured and brought in to do some research, also on free ranging, that they easily could fit under the situation where I cook would be beneficial. Great, thank you. A question from Al Kane. If an agency or institution with which a PI is affiliated stands up their own IACUC, how does a cooperator or funding agency ensure it is an official or approved committee that is correctly operating under applicable guidelines? Oh, that's not fair, Al. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you separately on that one. <laughs> I'll be back in touch. Uh, can you read that question again? That's complicated. Sure. If an agency in, or an institution with which a PI is affiliated stands up their own IACUC, so there's an agency or institution with a PI, and the agency or institution stands up its own IACUC. So how does a cooperator or a funding agency, someone who wants to work with that agency, ensure it's an official or an approved committee that's correctly operating under the applicable guidelines? Oh, that is a tough question. Well, generally, um, when you have an IACUC and you're involved in animal research, teaching, testing, experimentation, you are supposed to register with USDA Animal Care to be an official research institution. That applies to the federal research um, institutions as well as to you know, private and even state wildlife agencies if they're conducting uh, research. So how would one confirm that? I think one would have to contact the um, registering institution to know if they have an official IACUC. I first would actually go to that institution and just ask them forthright if they are a registered institution particularly if it's a granting organization, if there's any funding, and as I mentioned, NSF funding or NIH or PHS funding comes with certain accountabilities as well. If there are none of those, then that would be a case-by-case -case situation, I think. Um, I don't know if I've answered that completely, but I think I would start with asking that um, uh, institution that has the IACUC, you know, what their procedures um, and their, their official uh, standing is. Great, thank you, Pat. And again, many of these questions don't have a clear-cut, easy answer, and so further dialogue is always invited, and Pat's information is up on the screen. If you want to talk more with her in detail about any of these, please feel free to follow up. A uh, question here from Taylor Cotton. How does this apply to standard procedures such as chemical immobilization and translocation of animals by agencies? Yeah, and I think I had kind of mentioned that towards one of the last slides, is there are a lot of animal activities. Some easily fall under the um, standard definition, you know, by the Animal Welfare Act of research, teaching, testing, experimentation. Those are pretty clear to follow and abide by those when you come into other of these, quote, animal management-related activities. It's not so clear, and that is part of this larger discussion is, at the end of the day, you know, one could take the perspective of, from the animal <coughs> perspective, it doesn't know the difference between an action that is considered research versus management. It just knows it got a dart shot at it, right? Or it just fell into a trap, and it doesn't know whether it's a research study or a management action. So, in the sort of larger uh, perspective of, you know, ethical use um, of animals and reaching certain, you know, resource goals, that's the challenge for all of us is to realize when is it important to have an eye cook and when is it not necessary. Just remember, there's no penalty for going above and beyond the basic requirements of the law. And if you feel that an eye cook at your institution, an animal care and use committee, has value and has benefit to prevent <coughs> criticism, scrutiny, options to publish, there's every opportunity for that institution to make that decision if it goes as long as it's in minimally in compliance with the current laws and regulations, they can always go above and beyond that. Great. Thank you, Pat. A question here about regulatory authority. Does the IACUC have regulatory authority to deny a research proposal application? Um, for example, in the case of a state agency, if they wouldn't otherwise have this authority, does the presence of having a registered IACUC provide the state with that kind of authority? Well, by registering with USDA Animal Care as a research institution and having your IACUC as part of that process, the IACUC does have the authority to suspend 
research activities that are ongoing, or actually to disapprove a proposal that comes in. Yes, I mean, under that framework, the IACUC does have that authority. Now, if it's not a registered um, institution under USDA Animal Care, I don't think I can answer that question. That I would defer to either USDA Animal Care or to you know PHS OLA to get some guidance from you know the authorities. But in general, yes, if you're a registered institution, the IACUC does have the authority certainly to disapprove any proposal that it sees, and obviously you know give a reason for it, or work with the PI to um, revise it so that it would be an approved study. Great, thank you. Question from Jesse Trushensky. Do IACUCs have to meet monthly, or can IACUCs for small programs or small organizations hold meetings for protocol review less frequently or as needed? Yeah, in the, um, in the law, they have to meet regularly or periodically. I think that there probably are certain situations, depending on the volume of uh, research studies that the IACUC has to review, they can likely meet less often. We chose to meet monthly because it met our needs. There are other IACUCs, particularly at big research institutions, that meet more frequently than that. But they do have to provide some type of a routine schedule. Remember, they also have to do potentially semi-annual um, you know, reports to the institutional official, plus or minus inspections, and they certainly have to do an annual <coughs> report to USDA Animal Care. Thank you. Question here from Kim Flotland. How do I know if my agency has an IACUC? Who do I ask and where do I look? Oh, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they have a website? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we actually have put up both a, an internet website, so it's public facing, so anybody in the public could Google Forest Service, you know, IACUC or whatever and find that information. We also have an internal one or an intranet for internal resources. So I would suggest they try to ask one of the senior leaders in their organization, whether it's a department chair or department head, and they would have to start asking depending on what their infrastructure looks like. You know, go high to find the highest person in leadership if they don't already have some type of an organizational chart that depicts who is the institutional official. You could also go to USDA Animal Care to see whether they have that agency or institution on their registration. List. Great, thank you. Question again from Taylor Cotton. With the states, and this is thinking specifically about state fish and wildlife agencies, with the state's responsibility and legal authority to manage the state's wildlife, as long as the action being taken is in pursuit of management goals, whether those are consumptive or recovery, is it even necessary to have an IACUC? Well, that is the take-home message and question for the day. <laughs> And I can't answer that for you in a way because it goes back to those last few slides that I put on there is you have to think this through. I mean, if you're doing, you know, obviously defined research, if it fits under the definition in the Animal Welfare Act minimally to meet the definition of animal use, then the answer would be yes. If it isn't, and that's where we get into these sort of gray areas about uh, population monitoring, population surveillance, uh, translocation work, you know, even if it's depredation or nuisance animal control in some situations, it may not require by legal compliance an IACUC. On the other hand, it might do well to have some committee in-house that is there to provide you the appropriate type of guidance so that you try not to get into situations where you're up against public scrutiny or some kind of criticism. Even if you think you're doing it right and you are doing it right, you have this other entity within your institution that has done an, a peer review of the work you're trying to do and has agreed that it is good and that they will support you in that. So again, it's trying to look at the benefit rather than the burden. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, Jesse Trushensky, for those who determine that IACUC oversight is required or desired, are there guidance documents or other how-to resources for establishing IACUCs? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, looking at a lot of those web links that I put within the, the text or the context of the 
presentation and also some of those additional um, informational resources, I would first probably go as a one place to start is to the Animal Welfare um, uh, Information Center, the National Ag Library. Just start in one place and just peruse through that. And there's lots of information there. There's also stuff at the um, PHS, which is the Office of Lab Animal Welfare. Even if that particular PHS policy doesn't apply to you, there's that. And then there's also USDA um, Animal Care web link. So there are certain places to start. And there are also lots of training out there, seminars and in-person training, the how-to stuff. I couldn't cover all of that um, within the prescribed time today. And if you need more information, there's my contact information on the last slide, so feel free to contact me. Great. Thank you, Pat. A uh, couple, two more questions here, and then we'll wrap up. Question from Lisa Reed. A county agency wants to test a product on arthropods whose colony is maintained by blood feeding on vertebrates. Are there IACUC committees at county agencies, or would they need to establish one of their own? Okay, so we have arthropods or invertebrates, and they're trying to test some type of a treatment, but they're feeding on birds. Did I get that correct? Vertebrates of some kind, yes. Okay, so this is tricky because a lot of these are on a case-by-case -case basis. So, for example, we actually had a scientist who actually wanted to study some invertebrates, but in doing so, in setting out the traps that they wanted to use, they likely might catch some small rodents or small mammals or an occasional, I don't know, snake or turtle or something, but basically catch these what we call non-targets. We actually reviewed that proposal, even though the focus was on invertebrates for the purpose of the study design, there were going to be non-target animals involved. And what we did is looked at, again, this sort of issue of reduction and refinement is could they refine any of their trapping processes or techniques that might minimize entrapping some of these other vertebrates in the process of catching the invertebrates. So again, we tried to provide some guidance and oversight. And so that reminds me of the study in the question you asked is I can't give you a, a very specific answer. Uh, you can, one and welcome to contact me offline because sometimes it actually helps to have the IACUC look over these quote non-target animals which would be these vertebrates that the arthropods are feeding on. So there might be a benefit to looking at that. Great. Thank you, Pat. And the very last question here from Risa Conry. Should all animals used in research, even those that are trapped and released, those that are not ever even housed, be listed on Form 7023? And if so, how much detail would be considered appropriate in terms of locations and field sites, et cetera? Oh, actually, that's a great question because I will clarify that, that uh, <coughs> USDA Form 7023 is not just about housed animals. The housed animals is about inspection. The Form 7023 is about all the warm-blooded animals covered by the Animal Welfare Act that must be listed on that annual report form. And so those are the animals that oftentimes in the field research are the ones that are captured and released. So yes, that goes along with the approved studies, what they're doing out there in the field, how many animals and what species were ultimately used in that particular year, that time period, and their categories of pain and distress. So I apologize if you were confused, but the housing is about whether you do inspections of the housed animals, but the form is about any and all of those AWA-covered animals that were used that year. Great. Thank you very much for that clarification, Pat, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. Lots of information, lots of obviously ongoing discussion and opportunities to participate in discussing these important topics at uh, various meetings and various forums. So uh, there is certainly plenty of information here. Encourage everyone who has additional questions to feel free to follow up with Pat. Her contact information is on the screen right now. We can also provide you with copies of the PowerPoint presentation. Pat can provide you with that. I can. Monica Tarmacy or Nicole Zimmerman, whose contact information were on the flyer. And this, as I mentioned, this webinar has been recorded, and the recording will be made available on the AFWA YouTube channel. At this point, I'm going to unmute the conference the line. has been unmuted.
and we'll turn it over to our good friend and colleague, John Roethlisberger from the Forest Service for any closing remarks. John. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. On behalf of the Research and Development Branch of the Forest Service, uh, we thank everyone for participating in today's webinar and special thanks to Dr. Pat Klein for the wealth of information that she shared about the purpose and operations of IACUX. Uh, I think it's been an incredibly informative uh, session. Uh, as Jonathan said, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Klein uh, or to any other Forest Service scientist for uh, help or opportunities to collaborate, and uh, Jonathan and I can help make connections as needed if there are uh, interest in collaborating. Um, lastly, uh, we greatly appreciate Jonathan Maudsley and all of his efforts uh, to organize and host these webinars and, uh, again, express our gratitude to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies for uh, the opportunity to work together on this webinar series. Uh, please share any feedback you may have about these webinars. And uh, as well as that, uh, we're interested in topic suggestions. If there are areas of interest that you'd like to hear more about that the Forest Service Fish and Wildlife Research Group may be able to help with, please let us know. Our next planned webinar uh, will be in October. Uh, more information about that will be forthcoming soon. So please stay tuned and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, Pat. Thank you all for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.